All right, and welcome to Interpreting Scripture According to Scripture with Dal Skabelka. In this episode, we continue our journey through Genesis 1, going verse by verse. In this episode, Genesis 1, 6 through 8. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. We get a further description of the waters being mentioned in Genesis 1, 9 through 10, as it reads, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters were, that were gathered together were the seas. So we get a picture given to us that we have waters above, divided by a firmament, which was called heaven, and the waters below, which were called the sea. So the waters above and the waters below, divided by the firmament called heaven. The waters and the sea. A motif. A motif is a distinctive repeating uh, feature or idea. It helps develop other narrative aspects such as theme or mood. A narrative motif can be created through the use of imagery, structural components, language, and other elements throughout scripture, or literature rather. We are going to look at the motif of the waters and the sea used in scripture. The first text that we're going to look at begins in Revelation 17, as an angel delivers a message. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Now this disturbed the receiver of this message, so the angel interpreted the message, saying, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery. And he said, The waters which you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The angel said that the waters represent people groups. As we read in Daniel 7, in a very similar account as Daniel, who has received a message in a vision, and we are going to remember that the waters below were called the sea. So we're going to read this in that context of that same picture as it's showing the same elements. And what do we hear? Daniel declared, a, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions in my, of my head alarmed me. So I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So we can see that this situation is actually quite reflective of what we're reading in Revelation. And what was the interpretation given to Daniel? These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So, just like we read the waters were described as people groups, here we see that these four great beasts coming out of the sea, and the waters were called the sea, are actually four kings that live on the earth. So, we got two examples to begin this motif of seeing the waters and the sea being used as covenant terms for people groups. Now, as we move into Isaiah, we're going to read it in a more narrative aspect to see how waters and sea get used. In the story of Isaiah, we begin in verse 4, reading, For before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke, saying, Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently, Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all of his glory. Interestingly, here we see that the king of Assyria, a great king of a nation, just as we read here, four great beasts, which will rise out of the earth, which are four kings. Here we have a king of Assyria in all of his glory being referred to as the waters of the river. And what will happen when he rises up? It will rise over all of its channels and go over its banks. 
and it will sweep into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. Its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Peoples being used by God to punish are being described here as floodwaters and storms. And it is in the same manner as we previously read in the motif, a king of Assyria being akin to the waters. An interesting uh, story here in Psalm 18, as we read about David and how he reaches out to be delivered from enemies. The description of the enemies is what is of interest to us. So we'll give this a quick read. As a psalm of David, who spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. In verse 3 we read, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Well, who are his enemies? Well, then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundation of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord. And he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, and he delivered me from my strong enemy, from them which hated me. So God above took David out of the waters below, which are his human enemies. This language it continues into the Psalms 93, where we read about God being clothed in majesty and girding himself with strength. And the results of the floods are very interesting. For as we read in verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves more than the sounds of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea. Well, that's very interesting because we, of course, know that the floods do not have a voice. They do not have mouths. So what could this be in reference to? Well, again, if we look at this as people groups, it does make sense, for they would raise up their voices. And this wouldn't be out of line with Scripture, as we read in a parallel Isaiah 17 chapter, Ah, the thunder of many peoples, they thunder like the thundering of the sea. Oh, the roar of nations, they roar like the roaring of many waters. The nations roar like the roaring of many waters, but he will rebuke them, and they will flee far away, chased like chaff on the mountains before the wind, and whirling dust before the storm. So here we get an exact same description of the floods with their voice, the pounding waves, and the sound of many waters, on, and the sea. And of course here the same thing, the many peoples and thundering of the sea is their voices. We read in Jeremiah another story very akin to what we had read with the king of Assyria, with the people being used as waters to judge another nation. As we read in Jeremiah 47.1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh struck down Gaza. Thus says the Lord, Behold, waters are rising out of the north and shall become an overflowing torrent. They shall overflow the land and all that fills it. The city and those who dwell in it, men shall cry out, and every inhabitant of the land shall wail. Well, this sounds like a mighty flood coming from the overflow of the north during the changing of the seasons with the mountain runoff coming down the mountains and leaving people in a bad situation as the flood takes away their land. However, in verse 47.3, we find that at the noise of the stampeding of the hooves of his stallions, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of their wheels, the fathers look not back to their children, so feeble are their hands. We see the exact same language of the flood waters being attributed to the coming nation who is bringing destruction upon another. This is continued as an example throughout the whole of Scripture as we read in Ezekiel verse 26, or chapter 26 rather, starting in verse 2. For son of man, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, 
the gates of the people is broken. It has swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up against the, bring up many nations against you, as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, and she shall become plunder for the nations. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Just as we read in Jeremiah, this judgment of the flood comes from the north, and it is also another kingdom nation. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon in this example. King of kings. And how will he come? With horses and chariots, and with the horsemen and the host of many soldiers. And he will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you, and throw up a mound against you, and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls with his axes, and he will break down your towers. Just as we read in Jeremiah, this floodwater language turns into war language in more detail in this example. And it even continues to say, For thus says the Lord God, When I make you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you, and the great waters cover you, then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I will make you dwell in the world below, so that you will not be inhabited. I will bring you to a dreadful end, and you shall be no more. So we can see that the great floodwaters are a foreign nation bringing war and destruction. Psalm 77 Your way, O God, is holy. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. Well, we just heard the description of the waters and the deep being used to, as destruction brought on through a, a neighboring nation. And here we see the redemption of God with his holy people. And now those waters that were once used as destruction towards the peoples, well, those waters trembled in fear, just as the waters previously rose up, raised up their voices. In Isaiah, hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, who came from the waters of Judah. So we see this same association interestingly applied to the people judged on the earth in Genesis 1-2. Now just as a reminder, in the previous teaching we recognize that light and darkness depicted peoples. So as we read this, we'll keep that in mind as it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And here we can see the association to the surface of the deep, as it is actually defined as the deep, the sea, and the abyss. So we do get that same water association, as the darkness was upon the face of the deep, which was the judgment brought upon these people, which we just previously reinforced as well. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, those flood waters. So here we see a people after the waters, the flood waters, the destruction of a neighboring nation had come in and destroyed a people, leaving them in a place of destitution. So the first group of waters mentioned in the Bible are the people left in darkness from judgment, the flood waters. Now, the second group of people we read, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God divided the light from the darkness. And again, a reminder that in that previous teaching, we recognized the light and darkness were covenant peoples. So in that context, the second group was the new waters of light, contrasting the waters of darkness. And just as we read that the light was divided from the darkness, we also read, and God divided the waters from the waters. So just as in day one, the light and darkness were divided, that and the light and darkness represented covenant people, we also read in day two that the waters were divided from the waters, which also represent people groups. 
So we have waters above the light, which was divided by the firmament called heaven, from the waters below the sea, which are the darkness. God deals with the people of darkness by calling to himself a people to come out of that darkness, the people of light. And the light is good, which is called day, and it was separated from the darkness called night. And thusly we have two defined people groups, both named by God, the kingdom of light, which is the day, the light, and good, and the kingdom of darkness, the night and the darkness, the two groups of people, the two waters. And this um, similar, uh, similar scenario uh, as is seen throughout Scripture. In this example, we see this scene with the people lost in darkness, the waters of darkness. In Isaiah 9, we read, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Well, of course, if we use the word waters to represent people, it falls into the exact same motif that we have been reading. The waters who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. In a more literal example of this, we can read in Exodus 10, the same Genesis 1-2 scenario. For Moses, the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there might be darkness over the land of Egypt. And there was a pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. But all the people, or all the waters of Israel, had light where they lived. So this is a judgment of God resulting in darkness on the land of Egypt, in which the covenant people of light were separated. And we see that division between the light and the darkness, and the waters from the waters, throughout scripture with the covenant men of light. As the example, the covenant man of light being divided into their own land, beginning with Adam. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden. Israel, you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, and uh, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated or divided you from the peoples, the waters, that you should be mine. Come out from the midst and be separate, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. The new covenant people were separated divided from the dark apostate people of Israel. Now the light waters, the peoples of God, divided from the darkness peoples, the rejected by God. And God said, divide the waters from the waters. And the waters were divided from the waters, and it was so. So we do get that great description of waters and the association to peoples, which brings into context from Genesis day one, flowing into day two, about the destruction of the people in day one. And in day two, a continuance of that story, as I just said, those light waters, the peoples of God, they were divided from the darkness peoples, the rejected by God. In our next episode, we will continue our look into the waters of above and below. If you enjoy my work and would like to uh, help support it, you can do so by following the information on the screen. And I'd like to thank you for this journey, and I hope you're finding it as interesting as I do as we move again into the next part, looking at the waters above and what, the, what that differentiates between the waters below, which again we know is the peoples above and the peoples below. Wherever you are, I hope this finds you well. God bless.